It has been a great day, um, and we have had terrific panels. We've heard from uh, academics, we've heard from journalists, we've heard from politicians who have worked uh, with Bill, and now uh, we have uh, the opportunity to hear our uh, Bill Krauss Civic Renewal Lecture, a keynote speech uh, to round out our day. And after the speech, we'll do uh, a Q&A. Uh, I'll ask a couple of questions out of the gate, but once again, we'll pass out note cards uh, for anybody who wants to write down a question and uh, try to get to as many as we can uh, before our reception, which will be next door uh, right after. So um, looking forward to um, the reception and uh, chatting with all of you uh, even more. But thank you so much uh, for this great, great day. It is my pleasure to introduce Governor Tommy Thompson. Governor Thompson served as the 42nd governor of the state of Wisconsin from 1987 to 2001. For those of you scoring at home, that is the longest serving governor in our state's history. He served as the U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services from 2001 to 2005 under President George W. Bush served as the interim president and then president of the University of Wisconsin system from 2020 to 2022, and is currently a senior fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Uh, I have the privilege of being a faculty advisory board member of the Thompson Center for Public Leadership here on campus, uh, which tries to help uh, students develop leadership skills and also funds faculty research related to urgent problems in Wisconsin, as well as problems related to public leadership, and we're grateful uh, for Governor Thompson's support uh, in that center's work uh, as well. One last weird technological hiccup of the day, and then hopefully we'll be on our way. And in fact, we can maybe even just move it. No, that's, and it's back again. Every time there's like a little, there's some gremlin who likes five seconds of chaos in between uh, each event. So um, we are delighted to have Governor Thompson uh, here with us today to deliver uh, this keynote lecture. So please join me in, in welcoming Governor Tommy Thompson. Thank you very much, Mike. I listened to you this morning. I was very impressed by your survey. It certainly points out how important this meeting is today. And I appreciate the survey, I appreciate your comments, and I appreciate everybody participating. You know, <clears throat> Bill Krauss was an iconoclastic individual that loved life, loved controversy, Love to stir the pot. And was just one hell of a good guy. Tony, thank you so very, very much for sharing Bill with us and giving us this opportunity today. I'm sorry I was not here to hear my good friend uh, Tim Cullen. Uh, Tim is uh, one of those very special friends that you meet along the, world, along the road, along the highway in politics. Tim and I go back a long ways, and he was a majority leader in the state senate, did a fantastic job. I got elected governor, and everybody thought that he was going to be my next opponent. And he probably was. But I had Jim Clauser go and talk to him. Now just think how strange politics was back then compared to today. Jim Clauser went to uh, Tim Cullen and said, how would you like to join the Thompson administration? Cullen says, why in the hell would I want to do that? And uh, he uh, thought about it and said, well, it's sort of intriguing. Which cabinet position could I have? Which one do you want? What about highways? OK, sure. Call that. What about health and human services? Fine. And I just bring that up because it's so surreal compared to politics today that you'd have that kind of a discussion and that kind of come togetherness. And nobody, Tim didn't tell anybody, we didn't tell anybody. And on Monday morning, we had a press conference right outside the minority leader's office where I was still the minority leader, and all the press was there. That's when the press covered the Capitol, which is another subject I hope we get into today. And uh, I introduced uh, 
And Tim was at the table, and I came in, and uh, all the press was, what is, what's Tim Cullen doing here? This was uh, right after I had gotten elected, before I was sworn in, and uh, I introduced Tim as my next, or my Secretary of Health and Human Services. You could have, <laughs> you could have heard a pin drop. Nobody believed it. Nobody could even condone it. But it was a, a fantastic mar marriage for me, one of my greatest appointments. And Tim did a fantastic job, and I'm very happy he's here today. And Barbara Lawton just shows you, you know, how throughout life you can have differences, but you can also come together and be fantastic friends. Barbara Lawton and I, there was really nothing that we really liked about each other. It, <laughs> we ran against each other, and uh, uh, her and Ed Garvey, we had a spirited campaign. And I still remember the, your, your husband coming and interrupting a press conference in, in Green Bay one morning. And uh, uh, Barbara Lawton and I have become fantastically close friends, a wonderful woman, Tremendous contributor to the betterment of Wisconsin, and I just am sorry I didn't hear your comments, but it's great. And Tony, thank you so very much. Where's Tony? She had to leave. Oh, she had to leave. Okay. Just like just like Bill Krause, he didn't like me either. <laughs> no. I want to thank all of you. I mean this from the bottom of my heart because this is a subject that is very, very important to me. Thank you for the kind introduction, Mike. I want to tell you how happy I am to be here, to give this keynote lecture and share the lessons and some advice from my 80 years of experience. Can you believe that, 80 years? Almost all of us, almost all of those 80 years have been in public service, and certainly every bit of it with a deep love for this great state of Wisconsin we call home. Our nation and the promise we inherited will pass along to our grandchildren and their children. With such an esteemed group and for such an important purpose, Mike, and all of you, to highlight, to recognize, and lift up the life and work of our friend Bill Kraus. Tony, it was so good to spend some time with you last night. Thank you for the honor and the opportunity. I have to tell you, though, in all candor, that if this were 1979, that's when uh, <clears throat> Lee Sherman Dreyfus took over, and uh, Margaret, you were there. You were on the Dreyfus uh, uh, bandwagon. I was not. And uh, Bill Krause, Bill Krause, and there was a, a group of Republicans, Bill Krause and uh, Lee Sherman Dreyfus, and uh, and there was uh, more on the liberal side of the Republicans, and uh, they looked at me with a little bit of suspicion because I was too conservative. I'm not sure I would have been Bill's first choice to pick tonight to keynote a lecture in his honor, <laughs> especially without a chance to share his observations about my comments, but more on that in a little bit. I also want to thank and recognize the participants that preceded me and contributed to this program today. It is so vitally important. All made possible by Bill and Tony's efforts for the public good, for the good of the university, good of the city of Madison, good for the state of Wisconsin, and the generosity, of course, of the Tau Foundation. Thank you very much. I see my good friend, Tim Cullen, and I am very happy always to see him. I appointed my Democrat friend, as I said, to the Secretary of Health and Services. You might imagine that was a little bit of grumbling back then, more on the Democrat side than on the Republican side. Democrats had lost their standard bearer to run against me, and uh, Republicans didn't particularly care for them. So it was, a, it was not, that's not really true, but there was a degree of animosity. Uh, but Tim has been a great friend, great colleague, and we've been friends throughout life, and I'm very happy that he joined me. If you want one example, example of a healthy civic environment, 
you can put that episode in your notes. Take a chance. Take a gamble. One of the smartest things I did was put Tim Cullen in as Secretary of Health and Human Services. Who was in charge of welfare reform? Tim Cullen. We got it through the democratically controlled legislature. Almost impossible to think today would ever happen. I'm not sure, but I think Bill Krause and I, except for Margaret, might be the only Republicans on the program today. I'll try to do that right by you, Bill. And even as a Republican, I believe I'm on very familiar ground here today. I came here from Elroy, Wisconsin as an undergraduate and went to law school over the hill. As a legislator, as a governor, health secretary, army officer, and businessman, this university was never far from my heart or my public priorities. From Madison to Washington, D.C. and beyond, I helped grow and invest in this land grant called University of Wisconsin of Abraham Lincoln's in the public enterprise. This treasure of Wisconsin for Wisconsin and the Wisconsin idea. And the world it touches every day at all that it does. Bill Krause and I shared a passion and a commitment to this university. I do have to admit a little this afternoon, the last time I was in this room, I was the University of Wisconsin system president. And so a little bit of sort of melancholy to be here as just a citizen, a system that I also helped along with Tim Cullen create back with Governor Lucy in the Merger Act of 1974. I voted on that merger bill. That's how long I've been involved in government. And not many people even knew that there was two university systems up until 1974. Jeff Smoller knows that, but back then, we had two university systems and Governor Lucy put it together and it was a really controversial fight. It was the right thing to do, but it required Democrats and Republicans, you know, after a lot of fighting and debating to come up with the necessary votes to do so. Well, and sometimes, <clears throat> as I've always said, I can't seem to shake the University of Wisconsin and why would I want to? Well, in some ways, this is where it's all began to take shape, where it really started for me in politics. It was in my father's grocery store, where I would sit and listen at my father and people from all over the county. He was the county board vice chairman and head of the roads and bridges. People from all over the county came every Friday night to the Thompson grocery store in the evening to share some sausage and hamburger and cheese and beer and discuss and argue about current events. What needed doing? What roads needed to be built? What bridges? And how it was going to get done? My father was the county supervisor, and it was interesting to see the interaction of citizens coming together for the common good. Democrat, Republicans, and independents, nobody cared where you were. If you had an idea and could articulate it, that's what people wanted. They were determined that tomorrow, those citizens, not questioning the objectives or the motives, they were determined that tomorrow was going to be better than today. And they knew that they had a role in that tomorrow. And each of them individually knew that they needed to change and engage, and they did. They compromised at the Thompson grocery store. It's not one of my few fun, it is one of my few fond recollections of that grocery store. But I always look forward to it on Friday nights. And it showed me that regular folks, citizens, sharing their views and concerns could come up with solutions, positive solutions for their community. And they all did it to create a better life for themselves and their neighbors. And a chance to see their children do better than what they did. I believe that then, and I believe it now. And that's why I'm so concerned what's happening today. Well, today I'll share with you some basic principles that have worked for me and are not complicated to master. You just need the desire, the commitment, the purpose 
to be able to do it and move forward. Let's consider vision. Looking forward, so many of our leaders now look backwards or sideways. When you grow up in Elroy, and if you're not sure where that is, Elroy is between Union Center and Kendall, north of Waniwak and south of Hustler. For me, it was the center of the universe. And you have to be born an optimist and Elroy just to grow up in the morning and get up in the morning. You have to be. I didn't know I was poor until I came to the University of Wisconsin and saw luggage, students with luggage. I always thought that those Thompson grocery store bags were good for everything, and they were even monogrammed. And that's how I moved into Madison. So one of the most important things that defines my life, the ability, the necessity to look forward. Never, never give up. But never, ever take no for an answer. From a 24-year-old, which I was, I unseated a 15-year incumbent called Louis Rommel. <clears throat> and from there, to when I took over the University of Wisconsin in a worldwide pandemic, I've always been determined to push ahead and push forward and look straight ahead. And if you're not standing, and I say this all the time, if you're not standing on the edge, ladies and gentlemen, you're taking up way too much space. That was said first by Jim Whitaker, the first American to summit Mount Everest. I also have to tell you that after I defeated Louis Rommel, most people disliked their opponents. I happen to be one of those strange guys. I like people that I defeat. <laughs> I nominated Louis to be the Sergeant of Arms. Louis Rommel thought he died and gone to heaven. He was grateful. He thanked me till the day he died and left. He didn't have to go to any more chicken dinners. He didn't have to talk to angry farmers. He got paid the same as the legislatures. And he, and he loved it. So always try and take care of people that you defeat. Come back to help you many times. I always remember this little bit of advice though. Don't leave your district, Louie during an election year for an extended vacation cruise to Alaska because some young university student is going to run against you and didn't think he had a chance. There's going to be always those who assess, criticize, review, armchair quarterbacks, and spend their days looking in the rear view mirror, amazed that they never seem to be able to make progress or make that difference in their life or in anybody's lives. History is so important. We had a fantastic history professor here called George Santayana. And he always said, if you don't remember history, you're condemned to repeat it. I don't want to be reported as having criticized academics or historians of my alma mater, because I believe we got the, one of the great history departments on this University of Wisconsin campus. And that one thing, you've got to look back in history, but you always got to be looking forward how to apply it. But in a world increasingly filled with critics and skeptics, which everybody is, I choose today as I've always chosen, and I recommend to all of you, look ahead, plow forward, and look to the positive, optimistic side. Even the Capital Times, seems to like me now. <laughs> I'm sure the only coincidence is, is that it's happened only since I left public office. <laughs> All we have to do to get to tomorrow is what we have today. Sometimes more or less than yesterday. Sometimes tired or dispirited. Sometimes knowing yesterday's failure was a monumental setback. 
like the pioneers between St. Louis and San Francisco, or that young second lieutenant in the French Ardennes, with his platoon facing down the barrel of a German panzer, or a parent with a pound of hamburger and a hungry family to feed, a car that's empty with a daycare pickup waiting. The imperative, I believe, is to never look back, it's to push or pull or pray your way forward. In the future, the hope of the new day begins. There's been a lot of talk recently about going back in order to go forward. I reject that thinking and suggest that you do as well. While a retreat in battle may be strategically necessary sometimes to win the war, rarely does moving back ever result in progress. The first lesson to be learned is to always look forward. Second lesson I always live by is listening. Let me share a little bit about what it means to listen and why it is so important. I did a lot of listening in that grocery store growing up on those nights with the neighbors. I was there to learn and to learn to listen. It served me well and it set the tone for how I work with everyone in the legislature, and I mean everyone. It's not as easy as just not talking. You, you need to listen. And if you're not hearing anything, anyone who's had young kids in the house know that's not a good sign. You better ask and then listen very carefully. You might want to take notes. My father told all of his children, especially me, Tommy, you've got one mouth in two ears. Use them in that proportion and things will always work out a lot better. It's amazing what you can learn when you truly listen. It is a great benefit of others thinking and the perspective. It's a gift if you allow it. Too many people don't want to listen. They want to talk. They don't want to be bothered or God forbid let the facts get in the way of their feelings especially today. It's as if some prefer to be lulled into the comfort of their own echo chambers rather than face genuine issues and participate in solutions together. And that is one of our basic problems in politics today. For me, whether it was a welfare mother that wanted to break the cycle of dependency, a union activist angry and feeling threatened, Folks at home with bumpy roads or bad bridges, or a woman trying to get her businesses running with all the help from Madison. Or almost, which I was very much involved in, with all the African health ministers with populations dying from AIDS. And I assisted them by listening to them and helping to set up the World Global Fund, which is still going on today. World renowned immunologists, certain that they were on the cusp of a new and powerful life-saving treatment of vaccine. Or a president of the United States, which we'll be discussing later, needed to be persuaded to change his mind and ultimately the course on medical history called embryonic stem cells. Sometimes you have to listen to that little voice in your head that says, when the World Trade Center has been hit by two hijacked hairlines, airlines, airplanes, Washington, D.C. remained a target, and the country faced more grave terrorist acts or a potential war, and you're the United States Secretary of Health. Your place is to marshal the nation's response to that real and evolving health crisis in New York. I was the only one that day to be able to get an airplane in the air and deliver 50 tons of medical supplies to the city of New York by five o'clock that day. And it was done by discussions and listening and controlling. And I will tell you as a businessman, knowing what people want, whether they are bankers or employees or customers, it has to be learned, not guessed at. Creativity, the key to our future, is just what you've learned today and heard and know with your own value added, value added if you want to be able to be good or be better 
and move forward with confidence. Always be willing to listen. And because I'm at home, <clears throat> people like to be able to talk to you. If you're ever in a group, just take the time and ask people questions. And you'd be amazed how much people like to talk and tell you about themselves. When I have dinner parties, I make everybody stop talking to their neighbor. I make everybody go around the table and say something about themselves. And everybody loves doing that. Because nobody ever asks you, how are you doing? How did you get here? What do you stand for? We have got, especially in politics, be willing to listen. Who doesn't want to be heard, seen, recognized? Everybody does. It's more than a balance of a two-way street. It's a superhighway of progress. While I'm on being heard, each of us need to make sure Americans, no matter their station or thinking, are free to speak their minds and cherish the First Amendment. The answer to speech we don't like isn't to criminalize, ignore, or shout down. Like I said, it's work. It's hard work to listen. You'd rather talk. But listening is good for everybody. Freely speak, freely be willing to speak, clearly state your opinions. Those are the things that should never be said or tolerated. We have remedies for those who violate those. I prefer and do my best to be positive when I choose to share my views. Do I disagree with others? Sometimes, sure. Do I get emotional? Sometimes. Do I sometimes get a little bit, well, unhappy with ideas and some of the things other people say? You bet. But it's not the time to get mad. As you said today, Mike, so many people in politics, don't want to talk to anybody else on the other side, especially in families. That is part of why I chose to run for office and get chosen to be actively involved in making policy to represent and lead on behalf of my friends and neighbors. I can tell you, if they didn't like what I said, they had a way to take it away with their ability to vote. It's a very good system. The framework to govern themselves, it needs strengthening and defending, not hostility, indifference, and atrophy. I am really concerned about the fact that today, candidates run with no idea why they run. No policy, no agenda. The last gubernatorial election, 300 million, or over 100 million dollars, 300 million for all the elections in Wisconsin. And nobody had an agenda of where they're going to lead Wisconsin. Isn't that sad? It is to me. People like you, people invest when they are consulted. You're going to pick up a partner in your effort and double their chance for success. It's a win-win. I never thought I would ever say this, that I would join with Barbara Lawton in regards to changing the finance laws on campaigns. And it's amazing, you repeat that, not just Barbara Lawton, but repeat it to other people. And the odds of going through the roof that you're gonna find some other people that are gonna believe you. People knew that was one of the elements of Bill Krause's secret sauce. Only it wasn't a secret to anyone that knew him. Bill was a great listener. Warren Knowles, I don't know how many people here knew Warren Knowles, great governor, and Lee Sherman Dreyfus. Both of them were good talkers, if I do say so myself. Among others, Bill Krause's job 
was to take what they were saying and put it into action in their daily lives and their leaders. I knew and worked with each of them in Bill's partnerships, insights, and analysis contributed mightily to their success and in turn, the state's success. When it comes to principles, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything, as Alexander Hamilton said. And being against everything is not a principle. And that comes from a guy they used to call Dr. No, me. Some of you may remember that as a long-suffering member of the legislative minority, I was always prepared to stop bad bills, and I did. I was very good at it. What the nickname left out was that the constant discussion, cooperation, persuasion, cajoling, explaining, and sometimes fist-pounding, I endured to make our Republicans and Democrat policy decisions possible and even better. I also have to tell you that we solved a lot of problems together. And back then, when we had an idea, it was a Republican idea, we would quickly go and find some Democrat co-authors. And Democrats would find the other thing. It wasn't anything better than to pass bipartisan legislation. Today, Republicans, you have to have a Republican bill to pass. In a Democrat state, you have to have a Democrat bill in order to pass. I love the give and take, the fighting on the floor. Nobody fights on the floor. U.S. Senate, House of Representatives, they know exactly what's going to pass before they go to the floor. Does anybody ever get convinced about the merits, the arguments of debate? I was and remain proud of the bipartisan legislation that I was involved in, such as setting up the Department of Family Medicine. Democrats and Republicans together set that up. It was my bill, my idea, but I was happy. Hey, I'm Tom Loftus as a co-author. These are ideas that would have never otherwise seen the light of day if we didn't have bipartisanship back then much less become law, if there weren't principles to fight for and colleagues willing to listen. People back home are expecting me to do something when I was a representative. I was there after all, and isn't that what representative government's all about, to represent the people, to all of them? Those ideas that became bills and the law moved Wisconsin forward. And the Democrats knew it, and so did the people, depending upon us. That's changed. People don't go and say, I got, <laughs> I'm going to go to Madison and I'm going to improve education and this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to go and make sure that we do more in conservation and this is how I'm going to do it. All it's done now is how much money can I raise to tear down my opponent? You know, it's the odd thing today is, and I said it before in my speech, I've noted recently candidates don't tell us what they're going to do if elected. Not a proposal or a program. It's not clear to me if they don't know or they don't want us to know. I always told people, you know, that I was running what I intended to do. They knew why they were voting for me. Not just because I was a Republican or Democrat. They liked my ideas. And I think we have to get back to that. We have to get back to the positive ideas of our democracy. It seems sensible to me that when you choose a representative or a leader, they should give you some idea <laughs> of why you should vote for them. It may be too much to ask for, but how about a candidate discussing issues related to the office the candidate seeks? And what about debates? A radical idea. Require legislative candidates and governor candidates and constitutional officers to debate. Radical idea. But have to get up and defend 
Instead of having your consultants put out a 15 or 30 second ad how terrible you are, but to have the responsibility to stand on your own two feet, look to the public and to the press and debate that question. Leadership isn't running to the front of a traffic jam so you look like you're leading the parade. Some do. A leader I knew was like Tony Earl. Tony Earl was a Democrat, governor, great guy, great friend, still great guy. He was my friend. He was from Michigan. I did hold that against him. <laughs> but he was also from the Upper Peninsula, which was part of the old Wisconsin Territory, so forgive me. <laughs> I worked with him when he was the majority leader and I was minority leader. And guess what would happen, ladies and gentlemen? We would fight like crazy on the floor of the assembly debating the bill. And then we'd go over to the Madison Club or the park and have, as Tony would say, a beer. <laughs> we would have a beer and discuss what was going on in the day and more than likely, Tim Cullen, you know this, would reach an agreement for the good of the people. And I love Tony, I still do. He probably didn't think I loved him that much, though, when I ran against him for governor. But we had a fantastic, and you know this, Jeff Smuller, we had a fantastic gubernatorial debate. We debated all over the state. Tony was, as I expected, gracious and supportive when I won. And we have still remained good friends today. Do you find that any other place? I got to tell you, though, then I was always just a little bit envious after I defeated him because there used to be the thing called the crazy horse race. Remember that? Still is. Tony and I always ran in it. And Tony always beat me because he was a better runner than I was. But at the end of the race, on Saturday morning, Tony had a case of beer up in the bleachers and we always had a beer and toasted all the runners. But then what made me a little jealous of him, he got to stay and watch the spring football and continue drinking his case of beer, and I'm sure there was a couple cases, and I had to go to work. It was then that principles of leadership and listening became more important than ever. Because to lead, you must listen. You must stand for something. You must have ideas, and you must always look to the future. You just cannot simply be opposed to everything. I used to, after I got elected governor, I used to meet with the Democrat legislative leaders and Republican leaders. Every Tuesday, I'd have men in the morning for rolls and coffee. We sit down and talk. First, the Republicans. Democrats were in the majority. Republicans were in the minority. So I wanted to find out what the Republicans really wanted. I told them what I wanted. Then I invited a Democrat. I always had to buy the rolls and the coffee. They're too cheap to buy themselves. But I got them to come. And then in the afternoon, we discussed how we could come together and compromise. And just think of this. Tim Cullen was my secretary. My first year, Democrats controlled both houses. And we got all kinds of legislation passed on a bipartisan basis by talking and listening and doing what is right. I tell people today, I say, you run as an R, you run as a D, but once the election's over, you're part of the W party, the winning party, the Wisconsin party. Act accordingly and come up with ideas for the betterment of the state. But talking is 
amazing what you can get done. I always knew also by talking to the Democrats and Republican leaders what the problems were, or someone needed a little encouragement, how you could help them do better. And this was the way we governed the state. One of my staff members at that time, because everybody, my office was wide open. One of my staff members at the time said the office looked like the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, with people coming and going, in and out of my office, with little slips in their hands, phone messages, remember those? Notes from legislators setting the ongoing floor session, and legislators or cabinet secretaries being called in to hold or discuss how we might be able to change a vote. And it was about then, that time, when I and Bill Krause started seeing more together, eye to eye. In the legislature, I was a pretty tough and determined member, Dr. No. And Bill, at that time, had just won the election with Lee Sherman Dreyfus. They won a statewide election. It was not a match made in heaven. It was bumpy, but we were able to manage our differences. We both reluctantly stood down, just a little bit, but a lot of work got done. A mutual admiration started, and it started to bloom. And as I think back to those early days, I'm pretty sure the kids today, the children would call us frenemies. We grew to respect and like each other, and we talked a lot, sometimes at a pretty high pitch. But we both knew we were there to serve the common interests. And we're defending our principles with the expectation we could do better. Honestly, as I grew into the governorship, I started to see Bill Krause's point of view much more. Thanks, Bill. I became very sympathetic to where he had stood probably in those earlier days. And almost overnight, he became a wise sage of politics and governing to me. So I guess where you stand can sometimes be informed by where you sat, and I was now the governor. And as they say, the rest is history. Bill's ability and determination to listen to everyone and include Democrats and Republicans in his thinking and plans while he worked for a Republican would be novel by today's standards. It definitely worked for me as governor, it worked for Lee Sherman Dreyfus, and it works for anybody that really tries. I am immensely proud how I conducted the governorship and the confidence my fellow citizens showed in response. And Bill Krause's influence was never far away. He saw to that. Today, in and out of politics, we face a pretty stark landscape. Some of, some of it have defined it the three Ds, division, derision, and delusion. And while they're not four-letter words, they don't inspire confidence, to say the least. Because we're on this campus, and I still pay attention to this place, I want to share with you a piece of information or data that I find predictable, but at the same time, alarming. Madison released its 2021 campus climate survey and report it this week. This follows on a similar survey conducted in 2016. When students were asked if they spent time with people who were different from them, the results were pretty static between 2016 and 2021, with one notable exception. With all the many wonderful differences evident across this great campus, the differences that enrich my experience and those of yours, and that of my children and grandchildren now, and make the university experience one of potentially rich investigations and learning, broadens your horizon and the hope that springs from these young minds and hearts. The one that saw a significant decline over this period of time was the likelihood that students would spend time with another student declined when they found out they had different political views. 
Isn't that sad? Understand this. Our students on this campus from 2016 to 2021 saw an over 10% drop in their reported incidents of spending time, often or extremely often, with somebody with a different political view. With another student who holds a different political view, <clears throat> while all other difference variables stayed pretty much the same. We feel it, we live it today. We know a generation of young adults and future leaders, our experiences divide in a way that is not encouraging to me or to you and those of us determined to improve this great democracy. Division is the new normal. It is amplified and encouraged by new platforms of communication and the commercialization of the mainstream news at the cost of real information and thorough reporting. And I think that about reporting is something that has caused a big part of the problem. When I was in the legislature, we had reporters, several reporters for the Milwaukee Journal, Sentinel, the Wisconsin State Journal, all the major TVs, everybody, Green Bay, Gazettes, the Appleton, everybody came and reported, and it brought a degree of responsibility to legislators, because they didn't act nice, they ended it up in the paper. We don't have that today. We don't have the reporters covering the legislators and covering policy. Today, political leaders in both parties get away with it. They're encouraged or expected to vilify their colleagues on the other side of the, other side of the aisle or face more extreme challenges from the Democrats on the left and Republicans on the right. This too is great concern to me and a great content for new platforms. These divisions are further widened by the type of communication that certainly generates revenue in a way never imagined. But right now, nobody has to say the, tell the truth. Nobody has to stand up. When I was running for public office, I would never lie about anybody else or say something I knew was absolutely not correct. Today, the more you can vilify, tear down, the better off you are. That's no way to have an honest discussion or a democracy. Now that I think of it, it adds that misleading or outright lies is what everybody believes in today. And it separates you. If you believe the lie, you believe it. It's not true, but some, somebody said it, so it's got to be true. It doesn't serve anyone, including the public interest. We took tobacco off the air, remember that, because it was not good. Public health. But today, I don't know if you'd be able to do it. As I observed earlier, the First Amendment is alive and well, but somehow lying over mass communication about facts and issues or a candidate's character, history, or experience to impact the outcome of an election seems to me way off balance and definitely wrong. Perhaps the only answer is at the ballot box. Anyway, let me go on record as against lying about anything to gain a voter's confidence, particularly about one's opponent, especially with paid media. Some folks get rich in politics, but all of us are becoming poorer in so many ways, thanks to that practice. We need to somehow to reject this as okay and hold candidates accountable. Now all we can do is vote no.
today a candidate has to have one or two more general consultants, multi-dimensional fundraisers, pollsters, policy advisors, lawyers, accountants, compliance staff, analysts, writers, field staff, and contractors for these field staff. And some even have wardrobe and style consultants, not John Fetterman. <laughs> But nobody is debating or telling you what they're going to do. What used to be a cycle is now big business. $100 million for a governorship in the state of Wisconsin. You can build a hospital for that. How much of that $100 million means anything two weeks after the election? Last week, we closed a chapter in Wisconsin. We saw a governor's race cost the campaign over $100 million. And then there's the bevy of third parties that are funded to the gills on both sides to weigh in with more paid media in calling and texting. Total campaign ad spending in Wisconsin this year is estimated to top $300 million. $300 million. What good did it accomplish? Can anybody tell me what good it accomplished? As we all know, $300 million buys a lot of commercials everywhere. If you wonder why there's this kind of money in campaigns, I suggest you consider the size and scope of our government. The federal government just keeps growing. The government just keeps growing. And how these expenditures to influence elections correlate to the expansion of our government's authority, control, entitlements, and spending without regard for a balance sheet. And that leads me to the next problem, candidates. Candidates matter, my friends. We have to recruit good candidates. But if you're going to get vilified to the tune of millions of dollars of how terrible you are, why does anybody good want to run for public office? We still have great candidates, don't get me wrong. But I bet we would have a lot more if we could find people to come. And no, I'm going to be attacked, sure. But be truthful about it. I don't care if you tell people I'm ugly because I am. It's a truth. But I don't have two heads. Candidates matter, my friends. From the time I was recruiting candidates in the assembly, I knew and I instructed our team that the candidate matters. I knew it. I lived it. Nobody gave me a snowball's chance in a hot spot to win in 1966 or 20, 20 years later in 1986. In fact, every, I'll just tell you a story. Tony Earl and I, the day of the election in 1986 for governor, there were 39 reporters in the Capitol. And they all threw, I think they were, they were cheap, so probably $10, into a, into a kitty. Who was going to win that day? It was 39 to 0. I didn't get one reporter out of the 39 that said I was going to win the day of the election. And I won by 100,000 votes. Candidates, ladies and gentlemen, have got to be leaders. They have to be inspired by their convictions to sacrifice of themselves and their families, especially in today's environment. Successful candidates demonstrate an ability to connect with voters, knock on some doors. And it's not magic, it's about the honest work of listening and leading in developing policy. That's the Wisconsin way. And that's what we have to get back to. 
Failed leaders make for suspicious and disaffected citizens. It's the rust on the shining city on the hill, my friends. Expect more, demand more, and work to help them get there. While I am worried, and justifiably so, I still remain awfully optimistic. After all, it's our country, our state, our democracy. And it's just like all of us. Nobody's perfect, but we can all work towards improving our democracy. I'll give you another example. How many of you know Jim Doyle, Democrat governor? And everybody knows that Jim Doyle and I were not on each other's Christmas card list. And I had as much to do with it as he did. But he held up his end of the bargain as well. The good news, Governor Doyle and I recently shared a segment with Chuck Todd before the election cycle. Chuck was in Wisconsin to talk to us, Jim and myself, because Wisconsin seems to have gardened the reputation as a bellwether state for the state of our politics here and across the nation. They came to us because they heard that we were the most partisan, split state in the country. Interestingly, interestingly, Governor Doyle and I agreed that the state of today's election and current convention of style of governing was not what we would hope it be. But we reached an agreement. And I was very happy to have that conversation with him because we both agreed. I will share one observation. On the same ballot in a statewide election that Jim and I were on, I got 60% of the vote and Jim Doyle got 59% in that same ballot. He tried to ratchet up and say he got 62, but he didn't. But during the interview, it was obvious to me that two completely different political views went out and talked to the people of the state and got almost exactly both from two different conservative liberal positions. But that's democracy. And that's ideas. That's leadership. That's hard work. That's an agenda. And that's not a bunch of political advocates out there getting paid to tear you down because you're either a Republican or Democrat. And I think that is hurting our democracy. Do you think we can ever hope to see those kind of results again? I don't know. Something in my heart says it can be. And here's something else that really shocks you. I'm a Republican and I carried Dane County, and I carried Milwaukee County. Almost unheard of today. And I only tell you that because it was possible back then, it could be possible again today. And so as I tell everybody that run, run hard, run as an R, run as a D, but once you win, Let's come together and be part of the W Party, the winning party, the W Party. And I'm very happy, I just read this week, that Speaker Voss has indicated a desire and willingness to talk with the governor. Can you imagine this? In the last two years, the governor and the legislature have not met. The biggest entity in the state, and the leadership doesn't meet. And I'm happy that maybe they're going to start meeting. For those of you, common occurrence when I was governor was to have everybody come together. It's not a novel concept, but one that I learned to develop. If I wanted to get something done through a Democrat legislative, I had to have Democrats on board. And I'm glad Robin is following some of the Thompson wisdom. 
and to do what Bill and I always had as the holy grail of our service, the public interest. At all times, no matter how distasteful or repulsive the prospect felt, for people of great pride and conviction, because it also comes with a heavy responsibility, one needs to subordinate those inclinations to accomplish what needs to get done and allow the next generation of leaders a better chance and a model to succeed in governing ourselves. We can all take a page out of the selfless service our firemen and policemen do to honor their service and honor legislators to do the right thing. And rather than isolating yourself or inhabiting an echo chamber, say hello to someone you don't know, or how about making an effort to talk, even if you differ politically. If you're confident in your beliefs or want to learn something, it's a great place to start. Just say Tommy Thompson sent you. And every time we fail as leaders, or allow and encourage our leaders to ignore and openly vilify each other and our fellow citizens. We're playing with the fires of destruction, of derision, delusion, and deceit. We need to get back to democracy and the promise of freedom and all the freedom brings to each of us individually in the world. Mark my words, we still govern ourselves, and for how long depends upon us in this room. To be good citizens, we must demand more of ourselves and be graceful and patient for those for whom it is not as easy. We all struggle. We can start with a smile or a simple please and thank you. To be a good leader, one must find the determination and self-governance to master the basic forms of interpersonal decency and respect that encourage acting in the public interest. Our civic life is dependent on strengthening the public interest and the health of the public interest depends upon us in this room and around the state. We must break the failed cycle of blame and rectitude. We must demand that our leaders truly lead and we must help them. I can't help but be reminded that our founders pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honors to break the ties that bound them to an out of touch and oppressive crown. That crown on the head of a king that commanded the mightiest fighting force and navy in the world. And while they made their pledge to each other, the largest armada ever assembled to date was setting in New York Harbor awaiting their defiance. It came, they left, and we won. And here we are. We can master and muster some of the commitment and courage to engage and change the course of our own history, move forward with increased resolve and renewed commitment, just like Bill Krauss would want us to. The next time you say someone should, you better be ready to adopt a purpose and see it through. Above all else, be for something, not just against someone else. It's a 180 degree turn that just might help us heal our democracy. Thank you very much for listening. end of our day, but let's take a couple of quick questions for uh, Governor Thompson. Um, the folks are uh, passing around cards if anybody has a few to ask. I am standing in the way uh, of drinks for all, which are right next door, so, so we will be brief. But let me 
let me first ask, you mentioned a bit in your speech about news coverage of state politics. Right. Talk a little bit about what you see happening now and why. So you made the argument, and this is empirically true, there are less people in state bureaus covering you know, our, our state. There's less folks in the, in the state house every day covering politics. You made the argument in the speech that this prevents maybe lawmakers from talking to their hometown paper and getting in to talk about what they're doing. Are there, are there other problems this causes that, 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 um, that you, want to, um, you want to raise? Yeah, it causes all kinds of problems. Jeff Smoller used to be a reporter for the Capital Times. If something was going on in the Capitol, Jeff knew about it. I only use Jeff as an example because he's here. <laughs> he would go in and report on it. And it would be in the afternoon paper. And you didn't want to you didn't want to be in the Capitol Times unless you were doing what is right. Milwaukee Journal, I don't know how many reporters did they have? They had three reporters covering the Capitol every day. State Journal had two. And every single day, those individuals, the Appleton Press Gazette, John Wingard, the Dean of Journalism. You didn't want to cross, you didn't want to cross the Dean of Journalism. You did not want to be in a story unless it was for good. And as a result of that, legislators played nice, better nice, and they had to come up with ideas and programs. And what really helped is when they wrote about your legislation, you could put it back to your constituents. They knew you were doing something. Today, that doesn't happen. Newspapers don't have the money, the resources. They don't want to do it. And the coverage is so nil or so small, there's nobody held accountable. And in a democracy, people have got to be held accountable. And that's what I am really concerned about, is the accountability and the ability to get out there and be able to articulate what's going on. Instead of just, you know, some little tidbit that somebody puts out that may be truthful or not. You know, I don't know if Jeff Schmoller ever wrote one positive piece about me. <laughs> but I knew he was, he was after the good. And if it was in the paper, more than likely he had checked it out and it was correct. Nobody checks the facts anymore. He can say anything, oh, it's written down. Because the reporters don't have the time or the resources to check it out. And that hurts the democracy. It hurts representative government. So we've spent the day talking about news coverage, talking about campaign finance reform, and talking about redistricting. Your speech touched a lot on news and on campaign finance. Didn't talk as much about redistricting, but I know it's something that, that you think about and care about. One question, there are a couple of questions came in about, about it, but the one that I think is, is I, I'm interested in your answer on this especially. Given your ability to pass things in bipartisan ways when you, your party didn't have the majority in state government, how would you address the redistricting crisis from a tactical perspective? <clears throat> we have to get a handle on it. I don't have an answer. But I'll tell you what my biggest fear is and what I really consider the problems facing our democracy right now is that Jeff Smoller is from Madison. He's a liberal. Nice guy, but he's a liberal. I don't trust him. I don't like him. And that's not true. He's a very good friend of mine. But Jeff Smoller represents the central part of Madison. And he's a Democrat. I'm a Republican. I want to run against him in Madison, OK? Just an example. Not a chance, but, but I want to. I want, Jeff, because of redistricting, he's got this safe Democrat area. Why would Jeff, in a safe Democrat area, ever want to talk to me or debate me or even, even 
bother to have coffee with me. Because if he's caught talking to me, the George Soros part of his party will find somebody more liberal than him to run against him. So in order to prevent somebody more liberal than Jeff, which I don't think is possible, but <laughs> to run against him, it's not going to happen. A follow-up from and the crowd. So that's why, that's why, that's why we, we have to, you know, it's the same thing in the Republican district. So there's no bringing together, no reason to debate a candidate in a district that's safe for one political party or the other. And we got to get back to that. Unbeknownst to us, a, a, a member of the crowd a asked a follow-up to this, which is a perfect follow-up, I think, which is, how do we get more people to be competitive in primaries who are committed to public service and not political gain? So we have these, you know, as in your example, it's the primary he has to worry about in this, re in this, re in this gerrymandering issue. How do we make primaries races where people who are running to be committed to public service and not partisan you, you, animus. Got, you, you've just got to encourage more people to get involved and, and be able to run. It's pretty darn difficult to run against somebody that's an incumbent. I did, and I won, because I wanted to win. But if you really want primaries, you've got to go out and encourage them. You've got to encourage candidates to run in the primary. And that is so important. And unless you do this, you know, it's going to be a steadfast, you know, Republican majority until redistricting is over. And a Democrat majority if it's a Democrat state. And that's my, that, it really gets the heart of our democracy. You've got to be able, you've got to be able to bring people into the fold and have them campaign and be able to run against each other. I don't have the answer. I know Tim Cullen and I have talked about it. I was thinking, you know, that it might be good to have redistricting restricted to the districts, to congressional districts, and force congressional districts to have redistricting. You're never going to take the legislature completely out if it's dominated by one party. The only way you're ever going to get redistricting set up by a, a citizens group or another is when you have divided government. And that's not going to happen right now for the next 10 years, I don't think. And so I'm thinking maybe if we pass the law that says redistricting had to be done on congressional levels. You know, we got nine, no, no, eight, seven, eight, eight congressional districts in Wisconsin right now. And have those congressional districts set up the uh, legislative districts, it might change a little bit, and it might be a step forward. There are other things we have to look at. Maybe citizen groups come together and put together a redistricting package and try and get the county boards to adopt it in the counties across the state. Maybe do the same thing in city councils and villages and to, and to, and to pass, pass redistricting and see whether or not we can start making a change. Get more people involved always helps. More people involved in the democracy, more people involved in redistricting is going to help us lead it. But I don't have the answer to that one. Uh, another person asks, you mentioned in your speech that Speaker Voss is willing to begin talking uh, with the governor. Um, but at the same time, after the governor was elected in his first election, the legislature passed bills to limit his powers. Right. How can we fix this kind of problem? where the losing side can limit the power of the winning side before they take office? I don't know if you want to. I really don't. Uh, I, don't know if you, I don't know if you really want to start limiting legislative initiative. Uh, because it, it always changes. The pendulum always swings back and forth. Uh, and. I think you just, you gotta, I think the best thing to do is going back to one of my original things, having the press cover it. If the press had better coverage and talking about that and the merits and demerits of it, you got back into a lot of legislative districts, there probably would not have passed. And that's why the press has such an important role. 
But I don't think I don't think our group, this group, wants to start trying to limit legislative initiatives. I think that's bad for democracy. I think we may well, let's let's take time for one more question. This is more about our campus in particular, but you've just spent a stint as our system president. Uh, so UW-Madison uh, is one of the few campuses in the nation that allow registered student organizations to invite speakers to campus no matter how controversial the speaker. Right. How important is this privilege in regards to the free exchange of ideas and should the university continue to stand by it when people come to campus with ideas that most people believe are, are deeply objectionable? I'm one that does not want to limit freedom of speech. I just don't. I think, uh, I think that any time, though, that you're going to come in that's going to harm the institution or cause uh, problems, I think there has to be some, some safeguards and some security placed in. But I think everybody's got a right to say that's our democracy. That's what makes us different than everybody else. Everybody's got a right, even if it's a, a terrible opinion, and there are some terrible opinions out there, uh, you have to be able to give people the audience. I think it would be a mistake to try and. How do you limit it? I mean, who's to judge? Who's going to say what ideas are right and what ideas are wrong? I'm not smart enough to do that. I don't, you might be Mike, but I, 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 I don't think there are too many people out there. I think you've got to be able to be much more tolerant. I just would like to see us do more. I would like to have more speakers on, on, on university campuses. And I'd like to see more students involved in politics. I would have liked to see the young Democrats and young Republicans here today. I would like to see more young people like the ones we have here, get involved in politics. I tell every young person, all the audiences I speak to, do me a favor. I don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat, but run for public office. Get involved in a campaign. Listen to ideas. And I just spoke to out at Edgewood, and I said, I hope that every one of you Someday run for the school board or the county board or the city council or the village board, like <clears throat> the mayor of Middleton, Judy Karofsky. She ran. She ran, did a good job as mayor. I'd love to see you run for the state assembly. Hope you run as a Republican. But even if you don't, I hope you run. <laughs> and that's what we gotta do. We gotta encourage more young people involved in government and get better candidates to run. Now I think we can run next door and begin our reception, but before we do, thank you for the day. Thank you to the Tao Foundation for supporting this endeavor, and thank you to Governor Thompson for spending time with us. Today.